Good, good morning, all. Yeah, we, uh, Environ, where, I, where I've been for 33 years, recently did a merger with a Danish company, Rambol. We'd never heard of it a year ago, but uh, it turned out to be quite an interesting company, mostly operating in the Nordic regions and a very, very good match with us. So for a while, we are now called Rambol Environ. Um, so I've, I've been asked to talk about risk. Uh, the, the subject I was given was defining risk as the product of hazard and exposure, and we don't have to define it that way. That's what it is. So I just assert that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about risk assessment, uh, uh, some new issues that are occurring there, and the utility of risk assessment for the problem that we're going to try to we're going to talk about here today. And I think there are some limitations in the risk assessment models that we're using to deal with this issue, and I want to bring those up as well. <clears throat> so uh, the subject uh, flow is something like this, uh, a little bit on uh, st stuff that I think you all probably know quite well, what is risk-based decision making. Uh, there's a move recently to what is called hazard-based decisions. I will talk a little bit about that. Uh, my issues with what I call bright line models for safety determinations. Uh, I'm going to talk about the limitations of those models. Uh, a little bit then about what the problem is we're trying to deal with here, uh, some efforts to move away from bright line models and other decision frameworks for the problem we're, we're trying to deal with. So it's a big agenda, uh, but I start very, very simply. Well, first of all, I, I, want to, I always use this to remind people that we all do risk assessment all the time. Uh, it goes on all the time. This is, we, we do it uh, in what Daniel Kahneman calls uh, fast thinking mode for most of our lives. Uh, we want to do, do it in a slow thinking mode uh, for the problem, for the really tough problems. I love this little photograph. Uh, and uh, I always, you know, I think we can look and, look and know what these animals are thinking. I know what the cat's thinking here. Uh, I think it's pretty clear the cat's trying to make a judgment about whether that benefit is worth that risk. What I can't figure out is what the bird is thinking. <laughs> that's, that's kind of, it occurred to me recently. Uh, that the bird, uh, maybe birds don't think quite as, as uh, quite as much, they, they're purely intuition, I think, but it's a great intuition. So he's thinking something. Anyway, we, we do it all the time. So this is go, let me go back to some original guiding principles. This is very sort of high school uh, toxicology, if you like, but it's important because it guides what we're doing. Uh, we, we work under the assumption that everything we're dealing with can at some point uh, become toxic. Uh, hazard is the term we apply to the toxic properties of chemicals, and there is a dose-response relationship, point number two, and we have, we think, methods to identify what we call safe doses, doses at which we think the risk of toxicity is small, small. That's, a, that's an old idea. We've been working with it for some time, and then the model for safety is very simple. Uh, we look at the human dose, that we will look at exposure for humans, that's critical to the assumption uh, of uh, safety. Uh, if that falls below what we think is a safe dose, we call that safe. So that's an old and very, very simple model. I raise two issues here that I will come back to and expand upon as we go. One, how safe is safe? That's an old idea. Uh, what, what do we really mean by safety in this context? Does it have any quantitative meaning at all? Um, and then for, I also will point out that for many important and complex decisions, this sort of bright line, safe, not safe, it, it's not, we all realize it's not truly a bright line, but we treat it as if it is in most cases. That kind of model for decision making is not very helpful in many contexts, including something as complicated as the one we are trying to deal with here today. Uh, I will say, I will bring up something you, uh, may have forgotten about, but uh, you all should know, since you're in the food area, there is part of food law, which uh, call, called the Delaney Clause in the US, which says that carcinogens, this was developed in the 1950s, that carcinogens were especially dangerous materials for which there was, it was impossible to define safe levels. That's in the language of the legislation. And if something turned up to be an animal or human carcinogen, and this law still applies in some contexts, it could not be added to food, deliberately added to food. That's a hazard-based decision. It's based purely on knowledge that the material has a cancer property. It has nothing to do with exposure, nothing to do with risk. So that's a very early and still existing hazard-based kind of decision model. There are, there's a 
push these days, you might have noticed, from many quarters for more hazard-based decisions. Uh, the premises for that, that push is that some hazards are worse than others. I suppose that's true. Uh, uh, the carcinogens, things that cause reproductive uh, harm, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and so forth, highly persistent chemicals, uh, things that we do not want to have in food or anywhere else in the environment if we can avoid them. Uh, a lot of people who advocate this say that our current tools of risk assessment are really not adequate to deal with the problems that are raised by this, this kind of complex toxicology. And the third point, which is certainly the case, the decisions based purely on hazard are much less resource intensive. You don't need to go through the very complicated process of looking at exposure, dose response, doing risk assessment. So uh, as a model for decision making, this has some appeal. You can understand the appeal of that. Indeed, some companies I notice are following uh, uh, this kind of thinking, at least in some of their products, to move things that have come under the spotlight because of hazard uh, out of their, uh, their products. Uh, there, there are some problems with that. And <clears throat> first of all, I, I am an advocate for risk-based decisions, but I do understand the appeal of that in some cases, and that's something to be reckoned with. But whenever, keep in mind that <clears throat> whenever we make such an action to eliminate exposure or reduce exposure, we don't know how much public health benefit is being achieved. We, we, we don't know. And so we, we know that we removed something that people perceive to be a dangerous substance, but we don't really know whether any risk has been eliminated. We, we, we eliminated saccharin from food, and we don't know. We probably did not reduce risk at all in that process. Uh, we now know. I'm not sure we knew it back in 1977. Th this kind of hazard-based thinking is not very good, but not very useful, I will show, for complex decision regarding widespread environmental contaminants, substances like PCBs and dioxins and the metals and all of that, which are present naturally and also because of industrial contamination that enter the food supply or other products. Uh, you can't just eliminate them uh, because they are hazardous. Uh, we need a different decision model. Uh, I think this uh, same problem arises with substances which are naturally present in food. I, I put f substances arising during food processing in that same category and not consistent with most legal requirements. Most legal requirements, except for the Delaney Clause, do require agencies to think about risk, not just about hazard. There's some states in the US that have moved away from that in some contexts. Anyway, this is the pressure for doing this is going to continue. Uh, and the response has to be to sort of, we have to have find better ways to look at risk and do it more effectively and efficiently uh, to, to really continue with risk-based decisions. Let me now talk about two different ways we think about or express risk assessment results for, for, the, for various kinds of decisions. And here I'm putting it in sort of two different kinds of decision contexts, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, First one is the one I already mentioned, where we're looking at ma what I call maximum conditions of population exposure, the dose at which the toxic effects are not likely to occur. We've got different measures of that, the so-called safe dose. That is useful for some kinds of decisions. We also have a different model which, which attempts to look at probabilities of toxic effects, risks, that will occur under in populations under different conditions of exposure. We want to look at how risk changes with exposure and use that as a guide to decisions about uh, uh, safety. That's a, that's a different kind of model. And it, that has some advantages I will show over the first one in many contexts. Uh, <clears throat> the, 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 what I call the bright line approach, I put that in quotes because as you know, it's not truly scientifically a bright line, but we treat it as if it is. These are the ADIs, the reference doses, the TDIs and so forth, the, the upper levels for nutrients, they're all in that same category. They are treated as bright lines. And we also look, by the way, at this, in this day and age, as their derivation as purely a scientific activity. Uh, and uh, we will get back to that point later. What is the difference between assessment and management in this context? Uh, deri deri you've all seen this. I'm going to put a little slightly different twist on this. This is how we get to the safe dose generally. We look at risk of toxicity for what we think the most important endpoint is. Uh, 
We have a dose response curve and the traditional approach is to look at the low end of the curve and find the point at which we just begin, the point above which we begin to see toxicity. We call that the no observed adverse effect level. That's an old idea. Uh, this, in this modern version, there's a lot of move toward a model which I favor where you, you actually fit the, the dose response curve and find an upper confidence bound on it, uh, up, an upper bound on, uh, on that curve. There is a move toward defining a point on that curve. Keep in mind this term point of departure here for a moment. Uh, it can be some small value. Uh, here I've set it at point 0.1, a risk of point 0.1. Uh, the dose car this is derived by fitting the curve and finding the upper confidence limit on that and using then a fixed point in the response curve to define what is called a benchmark dose. This is actually a lower confidence bound on the benchmark dose. That is a more consistent, more from study to study, measure of the minimum effect level, the point at which you begin to get toxicity, than the NOEL is. NOEL is too dependent on factors having to do with the experiment. So there is some, it's not mandatory that you use the benchmark dose here as a starting point, but it is a better uh, value as a starting point and something more consistent. And we then go uh, from that point, and you all know we look at that and divide by certain uncertainty factors having to do with mostly variability across, uh, from animals to humans, across the human spectrum of responses. There are other uncertainty factors used as well. And we end up with an ADI or, uh, or some other measure like that. And uh, I just note that the BMD uh, is often used now instead of the NOEL. So that's, that's an ADI, and other values are derived in that same way. Not very complicated. I would say that this model we, we have used for quite a while for intentionally introduced substances, food additives, pesticides, things that we intentionally introduce, and that's a fairly good way to deal with the safety issue for such substances. Point number two here, though, is that I will say, tell you that the, and I think you all know that, <clears throat> we assume the ADI is, quote, safe. No one assumes it to be risk-free, and we haven't spent much time asking the question exactly how much risk is there at an ADI, and I think it's time we need to do that. And I've already mentioned the last point. I think this is not useful for many decisions involving what I call trade-offs, where we're looking at risk-risk uh, balancing in one way or another or risk versus technological limitations. That's part of the problem we are trying to deal with here today. And having bright lines like this is not very useful. I um, divide the chemical exposures that we're dealing with into two, and I don't have the great language for this, uh, but uh, this is the best I could do. I call, I group them into th exposures that are readily avoidable, if we need to, versus those that are not so readily avoidable. So I break them into those two categories. The readily avoidable exposures are things that result from intentional introduction. That's a pretty simple idea. If we think the safety criteria is not met, we can simply halt addition. It's the mitigation here, if you like, is, at least in theory, pretty simple. There's no great technological inhibition, uh, uh, impediment, I should say, to doing that. And so the ADI in that context, irrespective of the fact that we don't really know how much risk there is there, as we now derive it, uh, it still functions as a, as a pretty good safety criteria, and we've used it that way a long time. I would argue for many substances like contaminants, widespread contaminants of the environment, from aflatoxins to PCBs to dioxins to all the heavy metals, and there's a lot of others in food, uh, Exposures may be reducible, we probably can, but they really cannot be eliminated without cutting off the sources, and that takes a long time for many widespread contaminants of the environment, and some may not be uh, uh, treated in that way at all. That bright line model is not useful to understand risk reduction achieved with different degrees of exposure reduction. We'd like to know if we take action, what is called an intervention or a mitigation, we try. That model, the bright line model, doesn't help us very much to look at how much risk reduction we are achieving. We might be able to force to low levels, but 
uh, there are always going to be technological limitations to getting there and always enforcement issue. Just drawing a bright line for such materials is not a very helpful uh, way to solve this problem, I, th I would argue. There has to be what better ways to do that. Uh, <clears throat> carcinogen risk assessment came in because uh, there's a, it was sort of the first example and maybe even today the only existing example of an alternative way to look at risk. Um, uh, back in the 1970s at FDA and EPA, uh, the, 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 it was decided that some systematic way had to be found to deal with carcinogens. In this country, the no safe dose idea applied and the, the result was mostly people did nothing. If it was something was easy to ban, you did that, otherwise you sort of ignored the problem. And the risk assessment then came along as one way to deal with it. Uh, it was done in a very cautious way. It's still done in a cautious way. The no threshold assumption was assumed uh, and, and a linear dose response model was adopted and I'll show you that in a second. And carcinogens then would be regulated based on quantitative measures of risk or at least what we call upper bounds on risk. We don't know the true risk at low dose but we're pretty sure we have an, at least an upper bound. And one of the key ideas here from a risk management point of view that's different from the bright line model is that there's no fixed definition of safety in there, here. No fixed definition. You could set safety according to the risk you think you could achieve. That's a very different idea about safety. And it's actually, technically speaking, that is <laughs> what safety is. It's not a single thing. It's not the absence of risk. That's almost impossible to achieve, but safety is uh, some very low level of risk, but not a fixed level of risk. Depends on the context. The model uh, is this one, you've all seen it, begins at the point of departure and very easily follows a straight line down to zero exposure where there's zero risk. And the slope of that line gives you the risk per unit of dose and you can then estimate doses corresponding to very low levels of risk. Uh, now this is an upper bound, the way it's done we think the actual risk is not likely to be greater than this. It could be a lot less. Uh, we don't know that. We can modify this if we've got good mechanistic information. I don't have much to say about that today, but maybe we'll come back to that topic. That uh, if we have good understanding of mode of action, we may get a different dose response model. So this one here now has the advantages <clears throat> for if we need to apply it to exposures which are readily avoidable, and in fact, FDA has done this, for things like uh, uh, migrants from food packaging, for example, or animal drug residues, where you can avoid the exposure for a carcinogen if it meets, doesn't meet the safety standard where it's given a very specific definition, a lifetime risk of one in a million. So this is called a de minimis risk level and it's sort of equivalent to saying this, once you get below this level, there is no concern about health. It is a very, very tiny risk. It's, it's enough to, to give us a definable and uh, you know, set safety standard for carcinogens. But where exposures are not readily avoidable, you can use this model to answer the question, if we look at different ways of expo uh, controlling exposure, how much risk reduction, how much benefit, if you like, do we get for them? Now we, we need to make sure if we're going to do this at all well, that we get, we try to reach exposures that are low enough to give some large degree of health protection, but they don't have to get to the de minimis level necessarily. <clears throat> so, and this allows then, using this approach, a highly systematic way to look at the relative merits of different approaches to mitigating risk. Uh, you can compare them uh, at, based on the degree of risk reduction achieved. Uh, and the other point here I would make, the last point, is that it's pretty easy to distinguish assessment and management in this context. Because the, the manager really has to ask the final, ultimate question about how much risk reduction we're going to seek, because there are always other factors, other factors, uh, not least of which is cost, forgetting and the law and other considerations that tell us which of various mitigation options we should be looking at. So it's, it, that model of looking at sort of a quantitative risk model, uh, you can argue all you want about the, the limitations of that model for carcinogens, but it does have this value. It, it helps us, it is more helpful in making decisions like this. <clears throat>
Let me talk a little bit about the problem we're facing here today, my own uh, perspective on this. I, I divide the world of food up into those broad categories. Nothing very magical here. Uh, I've used this slide in many contexts. Food is by far the most complicated, chemically most complicated part of the environment we deal with, by far. And there I'm including the natural constituents of food, the nutrients, and the, most especially the non-nutritive substances which are in the tens of thousands. Uh, most of those we don't pay much attention to. Uh, the nutrients, of course, we do. Uh, chemicals produced during processing, that's what we're talking about here today. That's another very, very large group. Uh, it's not new to us. I came across, uh, I was looking uh, for some old information on this subject, and I found a very interesting article by Leon Goldberg, who some of you may have remembered, a very prominent uh, British toxicologist, spent time in this country, wrote a lot about food issues, in the 50s and 60s, and I think through the 70s, he, he has an article on the interactions in food and the effects of processing, 1964, uh, mentioning a whole bunch of th substances he's quite worried about. Uh, he thinks this is something that needs attention. This is 51 years ago. Uh, and he reviews the literature that goes back 20 years before that. So this chemistry is not brand new. Um, he did say that man is the only species that cooks its food. I guess that's true. And this fact has led Roe to speculate whether any connections can be traced with the high and undiminishing incidence of human colon cancer. I'm not sure where that came from, but it's in here. Anyway, so that's a very large class as well. The next three classes on my chart are substances that we, in one way or another, in intentionally introduce. Uh, the direct additives, grass substances, um, pesticides, veterinary drugs are all in that category, um, migrants from food contact services. They, they are all substances that get into food because of some intentional act of ours. And then contaminants of, of the environment, uh, a much more complicated problem. Uh, the tough problems here are the first two, the first two, which these are in the category of what I, the first two uh, categories here. Uh, this, this one up here, and the chemicals during food processing, I, and also the contaminants I put in the category I called earlier substances, chemicals not readily avoidable. The others are. So we need a different kind of model to look, I think, at substances in those categories. I, I think I will mention what Paul already uh, mentioned and I think is correct. Uh, we've been processing food for ages. There are some recent additions to the processing modes, but the number, but it's not unreasonable to think of these as like other natural constituents of food. They have been in the food supply like other natural constituents for a long time. Some exceptions to that I'll mention in a second. So just the numbers and varieties of natural substance, which I include processing chemicals, is immense. And we don't, we can't even get our head around it. It's, 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 hard, it's a very, very hard problem. To, th to think about in a sort of chemical by chemical mode. Um, and then I would also add that both risks and benefits are likely to be common among the natural substances. A lot of idea, these so-called bioactive agents in so foods, other than the nutrients, the bioactives and so forth, uh, are gonna at some point pose risks and we're also gonna find many, we already are finding that they reduce risk of one kind or another. I'm working now on a committee, the new DRI working group Dietary Reference Intake Working Group looking at uh, nutrients and bioactives, by the way, on their, and their effects on chronic disease endpoints. Not nutrient deficiency, but chronic disease endpoints. It's a new initiative from Canada and the US that uh, I'm working on with a, a small committee from NIH. I will, I will say, with respect to processed chemicals, and I got this idea actually from Leon Goldberg, I hadn't thought about it for a long time, but on the left, some reaction products arise because we're from substances that we do intentionally add. Okay, so we do add sub substances and their presence then leads to new reaction products. And he brings up, Goldberg brings up the nitrite, nitrate case and their production of nitrosamines. The nitrates and nitrites are intentionally added substances. So I think that's a sort of a different category that you might consider differently because that seems to be a more manageable kind of, more avoidable kind of contaminant if we need to. 
we need to look at, and I think this is the model that Alan Bubis will talk about later today, look at different types of interventions, how are we going to deal with the problem, Paul already mentioned this, um, and, and we need to look at how risk changes with those different interventions. Uh, the, ter the, the term used, I use the term intervention, uh, mitigation is I think the term used for this workshop. And for all of that, I've already made this point, quantitative measures of risk are more useful than what we've now got. And I, I, think, I think as long as we rely on the models for risk we now have, th this gonna, there's going to be limited success with this kind of work. We've got to move to more quantitative models about risk. Not, that won't happen overnight, but we have to begin thinking about that. <clears throat> the other thing to keep in mind in all of this is that many interventions intended to reduce risk, once you start fussing with uh, food, <laughs> you, you're going to change more than you perhaps think you're changing. And many interventions intended to reduce risks is likely to cause some other kind of risk to increase, or maybe many kinds. We don't often think about that. There's a very famous old sociologist in the risk area who said, uh, a a Adam Wildowski, who wrote a lot about risk back in the 80s and 90s, and he said, there is almost no action you can take to reduce risk that doesn't cause some other risk to increase somewhere. somewhere. And you should always think about that. Uh, there's just no, uh, they, as they always say, uh, no free lunch. Uh, so given the, the high complexity of food, I think this is a special problem uh, with food. Uh, there's a very good paper from, I have it here as well, from uh, ILSI Europe. You already know about this issue. Uh, it's called the BRAFO paper. I think Alan Bubis was an author of this framework for looking at this issue of trading risk, risks off and sort of net risk findings when you're trying to look at all the issues. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot of work in this paper, Alan. <laughs> it's, I don't know how much has been actually used, but it's sort of a very good framework for looking at this. We can't ignore it. Uh, <clears throat> moving away from right line models, there is a move, as you know, to what is called a margin of exposure, which just looks at the difference between the BMD and the human exposure. And you know, the bigger the better, so to speak. Uh, there's a way to analyze those margins to see whether they are satisfying risk criteria. And you can compare margins of exposure to different mitigation strategies. Th that is certainly an improvement of, of using the bright line model for decisions. Uh, but I must say, it's also not a quantitative measure of risk. Maybe there's a way to learn about the quantitative size of the risk reduction. Uh, but it is a more useful model, but it's still just one step in the direction I think we need to go. Uh, there is a way to begin thinking about quantifying risk for threshold effects. Most of the effects we're talking about are threshold effects, but thresholds, recall, are distributed in a population. We don't all have the same threshold. And uh, we, we, we might think of a, at any given level of exposure, with this, this is assuming kind of a log normal distribution of thresholds, at any given level of exposure, you can say there will be some people unidentified in a population having thresholds that fall below the, that given level of exposure. In other words, they are at risk at that level of exposure. So you can put the ADI here. Let's say I've, I started with 100 units for the NOEL divided by 10, divided by 10, the ADI is here. We could say in this part of the curve there are people at risk below the ADI. So the ADI is not a specified completely safe level. It's Maybe it is, but there's no way to know that. So uh, you could estimate quantitatively the risk in this region. You could even define the ADI as a basis of some very low level of risk, which is a target. That would give you a quantitative definition of the ADI. There are people working on that uh, at EPA and other agencies. And one can also translate, I think, I won't go into detail, the margin of exposure here, which is also shown here into a quantitative measure of risk. How much risk reduction are you really achieving with a given margin of exposure increase? <clears throat> so that's for the future, but we, a good thing to talk about. I'm going to conclude with a little bit from uh, this report, uh, which many of you know. It, it was 25 years after the original Red Book report. This report here is about science and decision advancing risk assessment. It has two objectives. Um, one objective was to find ways to improve risk assessment. And in fact, one of those was to make it more quantitative. 
The other objective was to make risk assessment more useful. There's a lot in here about utility of risk assessment. And that's, what I, that's really what I've been talking about here. Uh, it has a model for decision making, which is a very, very good one. Uh, EPA has adopted it. Uh, and they've actually written their own treatise now on a decision mo making model. Uh, you've all seen uh, elements of this, I am sure. It's in the, the report I described from the ILSI, basically the same kind of model, if you like. Always beginning with problem formulation, and, and we need a very good statement of what the problem is. Uh, the problem isn't the question, it is not what's the risk, that's not the problem. The problem is processed form chemicals and foods, and are they, are they a problem, and what are the ways to look at the problem? What interventions are available? The idea in this phase is to begin thinking about this very early in the process. What assessments are needed? Not only risk assessments, but what other technical assessments? Because if you're going to intervene to reduce something, that's going to take you know, engineers or food scientists or whatever to figure that out. And that's just not so, that has to be assessed as well in parallel with the risk assessments. You then move to the, you then, once you've got the risk assessment questions defined, you then try to answer them. That, that's step two, the phase two of the process. We look at what's, what's the situation today, what risk reduction is achieved with different interventions. Always look at indirect effects. Is there some other risk going up you should be aware about? And then look at net, uh, net effects on human health comparative benefits of the proposed interventions, and I will say something about uncertainty. So that's a good model. Then, then comes the risk management phase. Finally, in step three, someone's got to make the decision about what you're going to do. And uh, that's not, the, the scientists can be involved, but it's not purely a scientific decision. It just cannot, it should not be. And if the science is well done, the assessment has to be useful for the decision maker in every way, useful so that the decision can be made. That's a really critical criterion. And a lot of, a lot of risk assessments are done in a way which is so, so uh, things are getting better, but they are still pretty dark and hidden in many, many ways in what people do. Uh, I want to make one point, small point about exposure assessment. Exposure assessment is a very, very important part of all this. We're going to hear about that, I think, in a moment. But I say we ought to be talking about exposure distributions in most cases where we're dealing with complicated problems. Uh, the point I will make is that point estimates of risk are not going to tell you very much uh, about risk reduction. They're, they're part of the, the equation, but we ought to look at how risk is distributed across exposures. That's a hard problem, but point estimates, you can, you can knock down a point estimate uh, of some high end of the risk spectrum. And that tells you nothing about the whole risk reduction that you have achieved. You've got to do a better job with that. Uh, so I'm almost done. Uh, I want to bring up this as a report from Institute of Medicine in 2013 that's quite good on the question of uncertainty. Uncertainty is everywhere. It's inherent in science and risk assessment. Uh, I, I once listened to a, a, a fellow who was on the climate change committee of the, of the, of the UN. And he said they have a very big section on uncertainty. And he said many people who didn't like their ideas about climate change simply use that section to say, if you're uncertain, when you're uncertain, you really don't know anything. And that's not what uncertainty is. It's really about how much you know. <laughs> so that's, you need to say how much you know and how well you know it. And if you don't do that, then you're sort of lying if you like, about the risk assessment. It's, uh, it's, it, because there's, there's that, there's, that's an inherent part of any risk assessment. Um, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, said one of my favorite quotes, it's better to, better to live with uncertainty than to believe things that are wrong. And if you don't have uncertainty in here, then you're believing things that are wrong. <clears throat> Let me sum up uh, with these six points, which I think uh, kind of meld nicely with what we're, I think, uh, what we're trying to do here today. The first is, I think diet is immensely complicated and we need to be think of diet as a whole and what we're doing to manipulate any particular part of it can have effects outside that part of it. We ought to be looking at diet as a whole. That's an immense challenge and I realize it's sort of pie in the sky, I realize, but there's no reason we couldn't begin thinking that way. We need a good framework for decision making. Uh, I think the science and decision frameworks and others similar to it are very 
helpful to, to think about problems and decide what the science has to look at, what the others who are involved in the mitigation process have to look at, how, how well they should do it. It's most appropriate when you've got complicated problems like contaminants of food or food, uh, 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 natural constituents, nutrients, and of course our process chemicals. Uh, we can look at both risk reduction and risk increase within the same analytic framework. That, that basic old framework for risk assessment is applicable here in this case. Uh, I think we've got decision models for intentionally introduced substance, and they're pretty good, but I think they ought to become more quantitative. That's my view on this, and we ought to have a more consistent approach to developing them. And then we look ultimately at the net risk question. Uh, we're, we're, we always ought to be thinking about risks as risk reduction and risk increases uh, that may go along with that. So that's a sort of very, I, bit of, perhaps a bit Pollyannish view of the whole situation, but looking at things one chemical at a time is not, uh, does, is really a kind of deceptive in a way. We're not really looking at the whole problem. I will stop there. Thank you. <laughs>